Hey y'all. Excited for this next edition of Conscious Conversation. Excited to introduce a Can't Stop, Won't Stop um, board member, uh, good friend, longtime friend, um, Scott Liu, who will be joining us shortly. Hey, hey, Dante. As we're waiting, hearing a little bit of um, Las Cafeteras. Scott's joining us. What? Hey! <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Hi, Scott. Hi, Greg. Ooh, it is smoky right now. We won't talk about that. It's a filter. Oh, it's a filter. Okay, that's is that what that is? Okay. The filter. You know, we, we. I always appreciate a filter. It's actually not a filter. It's real smoke. Oh. <laughs> okay. I was like, I was like, there you go, being a creative again. <laughs> no, it's because California is on fire. <laughs> that that and we're in we're in the midst of another crisis. This this, yeah. this one's the climate crisis. We're trying to figure out if we're going to be in a. Dem democratic or dem dem democracy crises a lot know. of crises at hand you know it's it's 2020 man what are we gonna do about it <laughs> yes it's it's it, um, what I've shared with some friends is like 2020 is the year that keeps on giving and yeah. we are clearly still in October so we have a couple of months left before the <laughs> end, to an end of 2020 so yes who knows what, sure. what, what else we have in store for sure oh man it's good to see you, buddy. It's nice to see you, too. Thank you so much for taking some time to do this conscious conversation. Of course. Anytime. Okay. Awesome. Well, maybe I'll just do a quick, I'll do a quick introduction of you. Um, sure. I, I started a little bit right before you, you got on, but I, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll share your more formal bio and then we can kind of just dive right in if that's okay. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So I will, I, I, so Scott... Um, is the is Scott Liu is the creative director of Mia Riley Designs and founder of Second Space. Um, I'm proud um, and excited. He recently joined the board um, of Can't Stop Won't Stop Consulting, um, and with that, he brings 15 years of experience working across multiple industries, um, providing experience in fundraising, marketing, and sales, and management and, de and development. I will say though, how I met Scott. Um, was through the United States Student Association. He was the Student of Color Campus Diversity Project Director. Say that going, 10 times. You're going way back. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and, that's, and, I, and I was a student, and I was a baby student organizer who needed support and nurturing and guidance. And Scott, I was lucky to say, was one of the people that believed in me and trusted in me earlier on. So... Um, it feels um, important for me just to name that, that you were an important part of my development and maybe even the path that led me to even starting Can't Stop, Won't Stop. So thank you. I want to I start by saying thank you on the front end. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's, that's uh, we wanted to just quickly introduce you in case folks um, are newer to who you are. Um, and if it's okay with you, happy to start diving into to some questions. Sure. Um, so I so maybe the first question I'll ask you, Scott, is who are your people? Okay. So <laughs> who are my people? So for me, my people. So we talk about like community is really what helps drive us to be the people that we are. Um, I've actually through reflection over the just the past so many years, I feel like our people is constantly shifting. 
and constantly changing. But what really our people are or our community are the folks that we, one, vibe with and um, that we, that help build us and challenge us, but then also the ones that we fight for. Um, so then that way we're constantly making sure that they're getting um, supported, lifted up, and then also pushed to do whatever they can at the fullest of their extent. Mm. Um, so I, I mean, I could go very broader or very deeper into like my community is the Asian community or my people are the, my family or my people, both blood and through just relationships and all that other stuff. But I've come to also learn that like, my people are really the ones that help guide me, support me, push me, and then also challenge me. Um, and it kind of goes beyond different um, fields and areas. Mm -hmm. So something that you said kind of like struck me. So you, you talked a lot about how sometimes that they shift, right? Like your people mm -hmm. can sometimes shift through time, depending on maybe what space you're in. Yeah. Maybe like the, to, to maybe ask a question, on the other side of that coin is like through that all, or through this time or maybe through the I don't even it's been what 15 years that I've known you I feel like I've known you for some time but has there been any consistent like is there has there been a constant or a consistent in your people or in the types of people or um I'm curious on that yeah so um it's a great question so I think there's definitely been a consistent in terms of the folks that I seek out. So I am probably looking at kind of your previous conscious conversations that I've, I've looked at. I am probably one of the folks that has left nonprofit, the nonprofit world, right? Like the nonprofit um, industrial complex, if we want to call it that, and also just kind of that field in that area. And it was such a struggle for me to actually shift from it, to be really honest. Mm -hmm. But I felt super burned out from it. And that's why I left. And one of the things that I took away from it, though, was I never wanted to lose sight of why I did the work and who mm -hmm. I did the work with and who I did the work for. Um, based on whatever kind of field that you're in. So when I left the, um, that field and went into hospitality restaurants and stuff like that, it was very clear to me that my folks that I worked with were the ones who were working back of house, who were working late night, who um, were the, the folks that were in hospitality, not because they had this privilege to be able to be in the food scene and be really, really cool, but actually like, they're there to support their family and they're working late hours because it's hard work that nobody else wanted to do. So I think that's where this, the constant fit in with where I go. So I was always looking to help find people that inspired me and supported me, challenged me, but then also humbled me too. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where that constant happened throughout all the different areas that I've been in outside of nonprofit work. Yeah, no, I know. I appreciate that. And I think that's also, I think your piece around, so I want to, there's something you said around the nonprofit space. So like, and what you, what that experience was like for you to kind of lead that what, because yeah. of, for whatever reason, whether it's, you, you said, you kind of said, you, you said you were burnt out, maybe to really pursue this entrepreneurial, like part of, part of who you are, but yeah, I think one thing that I've been re reflecting on, especially this year, um, this year meaning 2020 and the, the the global health crisis and the pandemic that we're in, the kind of largest uprisings um, in the summer in response to kind of George Floyd yeah. um, and in, in defense of Black life, um, is that like I think that there have been there have been times because of my work in nonprofit um, is that. I think sometimes people conflate nonprofit with movement and that yeah. just because you are working for a nonprofit that you are the movement or leading the movement. And I think that that takes away the agency and takes away the power of folks directly impacted and on the ground who like for a large part, maybe have been pushing and advocating and protesting and organizing maybe 
outside of a centralized organizing hub. Mm -hmm. And so like, what does it mean to embrace and to understand and empower folks to say, like everyone has a role in movement, whether yeah. you work at a nonprofit, whether you're a small business owner, whether yeah. you're, you know, a, a nurse, a, a teacher, right? Like whatever role you, you have, like there's a way you can support, contribute, be a part of movement. Yeah. And how do we, one, help people better understand that? Um, or how do we like um, help people develop an analysis that that's the case so that no matter what role you're in or where you're at, that you feel like you can and should and will contribute to, to movement? Yeah, for sure. Um, I will like, I think I never actually recognized that until all of the stuff that was going on around um, the past few months um, within within kind of the world of small businesses and entrepreneurs because um, uh, so right now I'm in the wedding industry which is kind of a shift from nonprofit for sure <laughs> and like and um, this space was when I created this space this second space it was mainly just as a space to really bring folks together within um, within the wedding industry because I saw this kind of uh, amazing group of women who owned small businesses who just don't have a lot of cross support and also are doing it while raising a family or have a full-time job and all this other stuff. So it was a little bit on kind of that like really basic like surface level selfishness that I kind of had of like I want to help these people which is problematic in itself. But what I did realize is that like there were a lot of, so, okay. And then taking another step back, I went into this industry thinking that nobody got politics. Like I was mm -hmm. like, it's weddings, it's super traditional, it's super conservative and all this other stuff. I was blown away by the amount of business owners who took a stand, talked about racial justice and race in a lens that I was never thinking existed within <laughs> small businesses um, or entrepreneurs because there's such this stigma that I feel like where entrepreneurs and business owners are always going to be um, not progressive enough. They're always going to be liberal. They're not going to really understand the movement or they're not going to really, they're, they're all just money driven. And I kind of was blown away by this role that small businesses ended up having, having within it, within this, this kind of movement work, which was, you know, creating support systems, create funding systems, and also recognizing allyship for folks who are on the ground doing the work, because that's, that's the key thing that I realized. I never, I had this general really baseless assumption that in this industry, nobody cares. And that was where I was blown away, which was there was a place in the movement for small business owners. And there is a place in the movement that goes beyond just kind of posting a social media message or putting up a black square, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Because I feel yeah. like, I think folks would be, I think, interested. So like, maybe we can just start from, I mean, you alluded to it, but well, maybe we can kind of just dig into the, to your own experience. Like you yeah. said, that that was crystallized or like clarified for you over the last couple of months. Like, what does that mean? And how, did, how, how have you been able to feel like you've contributed to movement from, from um, your business, from your experience in your businesses? Totally. And, you know, I will like, I will say that um, this is definitely a very, as, as much as I've been in this small business realm of the wedding industry, which is a very small industry of like everything else going on in the world. Um, like this is really just my experience, but I feel like um, it was, it came mostly because I came from nonprofit right and I came in thinking that like there was and it was it was and we will I mean we may allude to this later but it was very much college college activism of the sorts in the early 2000s that made you 
think that, you know, you were the shit and you knew everything. And it was like, that was the only, only world, but there was no humility involved and there was nobody mm -hmm. that was being humble. So I didn't learn that until later on. And that's when I was like, oh, okay. So I'm going into small business and I'm going into the wedding industry and it's going to be full of really not great folks and then when i saw folks doing things like posting about it but then also taking the next step of like actually creating space for vendors of color and um, really figuring out how to support the black vendors in the wedding industry which is not easy to find in orange county california <laughs> so like so like how like it was really amazing to create those like opportunities here at second space to um create networking opportunities for them and um really help support and highlight the work that these black business owners were doing and then that kind of expanded into um like the Latinx owned businesses and really um, have figuring out ways to like create space for them that I think that, I mean, I guess one good thing that came out of nonprofit stuff is that I've learned to create space and how to create space for an industry that just doesn't necessarily get to have those opportunities. Um, yeah, I digress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so what do you, because I think, I think it's important for people just to, I, I think just to kind of stay on this thread around just having your own business. Yeah. And you talk a little bit about kind of the role that could, one could play in, a, in movement. Yeah. Like what, so like to even take a further step back, like what, what was the hardest part about it? Or what was, what is the biggest, what's the big lesson that you feel like would be helpful to share with maybe someone out there who was like, maybe I should start my own business. Like what was, yeah. what's, what's that, what's that word of advice or a lesson learned that you feel like um, would be helpful to share? Um, so in relationship to movement stuff, is that kind of that um, connection? I think, I think more broadly, but if you want to share in yeah. movement related to that, I think that's, that, that works. So um, <laughs> I will tell you, I will tell anyone who wants to start a business that it is no joke. One of the hardest things um, that you will ever um, go through. It's, it's one of those things that, I mean, it's very much like the emotions that a lot of folks feel like who do move like on the ground movement work, which is like, you're constantly anxious. You have anxiety up the wazoo. PTSD is going to be something that is in your kind of mind frame. Um, but at the end of the day, you're still super driven and super passionate about the product, the change or the service that you're providing that like you have moments to feel good about yourself. Um, for, for me, I actually, for, for me, one of the things that I've kind of figured when I did decide to move into this field, into this kind of small business owning rather and, but how to create it. So it's a little bit more supportive of progressive ideas but then also supports the movement is um and movement building is that like we are now once you it's kind of like the concept of allyship we're right now i'm no longer i'm i'm in the i'm in the world of business owning so now it's now and and a profit making ish trying to become a profit making field so now what my role is is now figuring out ways to support and use my um, privilege to help really support the movement through either fundraising opportunities or providing services for folks who do need that support um, or even just being that voice and to help spread education around certain things too. Um, because there is a very real thing about being a small business owner and then also having humility and mm -hmm. um, being humble and um, and acknowledge either failure but then also acknowledge that you can't you that you're not the best and I think that's kind of where that concept of whole community over competition thing that I really really love and support within 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 this kind of realm mm -hmm. okay um 
How has how has how has your business or how has your oper like how you operate in, in in this world shifted? You know, since COVID, like yeah. not, not, now that we're in a pandemic, how has yeah, can you share a little bit about that experience? Yeah, for sure. So as like any industry, it's suffering, right? Like that there's no real, um, yeah, like any industry, this, this, this industry is suffering and it's, it's not doing, it's not doing well, but neither is anybody else except if you are Jeff Bezos or one of the big box stores, right? Um, but one of the things that has been super um, awesome is that there's such huge, because everybody's at the lowest of their lows, there's so much support going on within this, this, um, at this area. Um, like businesses are now supporting other businesses that never, I've never seen support each other. Or also there's more collaborative projects and collaborative efforts that are happening because folks have to, figure out ways to pivot their model and um there is i do have a little bit and this is getting a little too like freaky and that world is ending thing but i do have a fear of like what that means how this what this current state that the economy is in and and the current state that we are in as small business owners um how that's going to affect and trickle down to um nonprofits in the future, right? And I'm sure this is a conversation that nonprofits are probably having right now because it's very, very similar to what happened at the last financial crisis mm -hmm. and recession, which is what is it going to mean once these, the economy does hit this moment where nobody is funding anymore? And um, so like that's also um, something where I'm like, it's all about like pivoting and that's that's basically what 2020 is all about right now is how to pivot our current state of operation to to match with the times that we're in do you think the ways in which people are pivoting do you feel like that's going to have a longer term impact in terms of how folks will operate even um you know god willing we're able to kind of move move out yeah. of the, the pandemic yeah, I, I mean, I go back and forth with this because I think that, yeah, I, I mean, the reality is, is that however we run our business now is going to shift completely or however we were running our business in January and February is definitely shifted now. And how we're sh running our business now is also going to shift in February of next year. Um, I, I truly strongly believe that because we are constantly um, regardless if you're in the hospitality restaurant industry, if you own a restaurant, if you own a small business store, you're constantly trying to figure out ways to just scrape by right now. And there's the, there is a hierarchy of like what products people are going to go to first. And mm -hmm. some of us, most of, most of, most of the world, most of the U S is small businesses are non-essential things their luxury products and so like eventually those things will catch up but it's just depending on where you are and where you're placed on it but i do think that small businesses and businesses and organizations in general um whether you're for profit or not they're going to be shifting how they do do things they're they're fundraising or they're um or they're um, I mean, really, it's fundraising, because if you think about it, that's what small business is. It's fundraising a product, so. Yeah. Um, I definitely feel like, to that last point, that from being an ED or, like, a head of a, two different nonprofits for, yeah. like, 10 years totally. to then, like, being my own, like, my own business owner. Yeah. Like, I was like, I'm basically just fundraising, but instead of fundraising for a whole organization, I'm fundraising for... Totally my business for my for myself right yeah and the, the exactly. team of people that i'm i'm working with so it's a interesting frame to like go from exactly. that but there, exactly. i think there's also just a different level like level of i don't know like, i don't want to say responsibility because i think there's still kind of that responsibility there but a different type of responsibility yeah yeah for sure and i think like that's one of the things that was super eye-opening to me too which was like um like instead of selling the organizational um, 
instead of selling basically the organizational campaigns, the victories, the deliverables, all that stuff, right? We are now, our product is now um, whatever we're selling. So for you, yeah, for it's, you're essentially doing the same work. Um, it's just now in a different, uh, different messaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, if you're if you're okay, I want to I want to ask some um, shift some other to other questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, so one question that I've enjoyed um, asking folks um, during the conscious conversation is, when was the last time you felt brave? Oh shit. <laughs> um. So the last time I felt brave, honestly, honestly, I don't think I ever have. Um, there's been, um, now, if you ask, like, if you ask, like, my colleagues and my friends and um, all of that, they'll say, they'll be like, oh, it was brave of you for shifting to basically it was brave for you for leaving leaving nonprofit altogether and going blindly into a restaurant and lying about your experience to get a job like and then just working your way up and or like opening up this space for um with basically no idea if it was going to work like i feel like those things do maybe qualify as brave but i also feel like if there's never any fear, then you're never going to try to do it. Um, mm. So I honestly, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever felt brave. Um, I've always been scared of what I'm doing, but I also feel like if I'm not scared, then I won't challenge myself to. Okay. I guess that's a form of bravery, right? I, I was going to say, I, I feel like that's definitely a form of bravery, but I guess then... Because I imagine there's more, I guess, kind of to, to build on that, I imagine there yeah. may be more things that, that you may be more scared of or less scared of. So like, what what is the point of when you're like, no matter if I'm scared, I'm still going to do it? I'm still going to do it. I think it was mostly this space is creating, it was when I was like, oh, I wanted to create a space for um I guess, this, yeah, I mean, I guess it's now going back to your first thing about who your people are, because it's like, I did this for my people, right? I did this for this group of um, entrepreneurs, like small business owners who um, I, I knew from my experience in the wedding industry, which was, you know, they're all owned by, um, by women who are in usually a space that's full of men, so there's no support for them. Um, there's no space for them to get together and create networking events or um, for them to come together to um, to ask for help, learn from each other. And so I think it was their kind of constant questioning about where that space was that gave me the confidence that I needed, that this space was, that there was a need for this space in Orange County for them to be able to come together um, because it is, it is a world of male dominated and very machismo, very white straight male um, like kind of world in terms of business support and small business support at a very localized level. Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, I guess that's, I've never really thought about that, but maybe it is, it's my people that kind of give me that strength um, mm. to become brave without knowing that I'm brave. Look at you. Like, look at you being all like, like therapy session with Greg Sendana right now. <laughs> my, um, my insurance won't cover this. No, I, but, but I, I think it's, you know, I, I, it's a, I appreciate your response, though, because I think that, one, I think, one, if we all could approach the world and our decisions with the kind of humility that you've even displayed in this conversation, I think our world would be so much different. 
right? Like not yes. just in small businesses, but just in our everyday day-to-day -day life. And so I know that for me, even as I talk about organizing and like if, even as I'm like doing a training or coaching folks that I'm coaching now, like that's actually what I start off with. It's like, look, even if, even if you are giving me this positional power of being the person in front of the room or I guess in yeah. front of the Zoom or like that you are asking from seeking my guidance or counsel, that that doesn't mean that I won't be able to learn or to like engage, like be able to uh, get something from this conversation with you myself personally. Because totally. I think that that's been a that, I think for me that's been how I've tried to at least connect across different generations or different like sets of people is like there is something that we could learn and from variety of folks, but it's is how do we actually be open to the feedback, but also be open to maybe other people's ideas, right? And so I, I think that's yeah. important. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I will be, I'm gonna let you know a little story about me. So my humility actually comes, I've had, I've, I've learned to be humble, luckily, um, through a process of working with amazing executive directors in nonprofit who um, also luckily amazing, strong women and women of color. And they've each called me out on my bullshit in a great way that made me realize that I was not, I had so much to learn. And I think one of the things that I've learned from them is that um, I need, I, so, okay, after USSA, <laughs> I got a job at Jobs with Justice New York. And it was, I didn't realize till later on, a job that was kind of really there to help support me and grow, build me up as more, as a stronger leader and a stronger organizer. But because of, and we've had this conversation and I'm probably gonna get in trouble for talking about it, but, but when we, um, when you come out of USSA, you think you already know everything in the world. And that was one of our, that was one of the downfalls of our leadership pipeline, I feel like, after years of reflection. But anyway, so then I got into this place and I didn't feel like I was being challenged enough or even doing what I thought I should be doing, which was not true. I was, I was basically at a space that I should have been. But I ended up leaving that job very soon to go into another job that I was way underqualified for. Um, and, but I knew how to talk the talk because that's what you, uh, that's what I learned in my first nonprofit job. And then, um, so the first, when I told that person, when I told my ED and I still remember this moment to the T, she said uh, that I was leaving. She was like, you're like, this is a, this is unfortunate. I'm going to support you if your decision but also know that you have so much more to learn and you're not, and this is gonna overwhelm you. And I took that as like, whoa, you're being super disrespectful of me, but she was so right. And I think it took me two more times to be humiliated, to um, realize that I'm not, I wasn't as qualified as I thought I was. And that I always have to have a constant need to learn that and to challenge myself and to better myself but then also be okay asking folks and letting them know that like I don't know everything that I know um, but I want to learn so then that way I can make sure that we become stronger as a group and stronger together um, and so I think that's what actually has brought me to the place where I am now, which is why I, I am so open to being like, no, I'm not the shit at things. And no, I don't know everything, but I will do my best to make sure that folks are supported so that they can learn with me type of thing, you know? Um, because humility is definitely something that was missing from at least my generation of, of organizers personally. I'm probably gonna get in trouble. Whatever, I'm not in this. I'm not in that anymore. So they like, come at me. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but like, you, but that's that's definitely it. Is I think that's and what you just said is super key. Is is 
we cannot grow as individuals within our own field or even any other field that we want to be in if we're not willing to be honest with ourselves and honest with our friends that we're not doing well or we're not doing it the right way. Um, because that's definitely one thing that 2020 COVID pandemic elections, George Floyd, every bullshit thing that's happened this year so far taught me is that like, as my, I can't, it's doing no one any good if I tell someone else that I'm doing well, because mm -hmm. then they're going to assume that I'm being honest. But if I tell someone that I'm actually struggling or I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing, that's when the support comes and that's when the people come out to build around you and really help and lift. Um, so I think that's one of the things that I would, I'm taking away from, especially from 2020, um, is that like, Humility is the key in order to grow. Hmm. I think that's an important, important lesson for yeah. folks to, to, to hear. Um, I mean, so I want to kind of dig in a little bit. And just in terms of Orange County, I think some folks may be more or less familiar with Orange County. Um, at least when I was organizing, I knew it as a place where there are a lot of Asians. Um, that there was, it was generally compared, especially compared to other parts of California, that it was politically more, or at least was more, or maybe continues to be more conservative. Um, and so I'm curious, it's like, um, like how has the broader, how has Orange County or your, the broader community responded to the pandemic, responded to the uprisings? And do you feel, I feel like there's also been a lot of resources invested into Orange County into yeah. trying to organize and politicize and um, whatnot. Do you, so maybe kind of share, like, do you feel, where is it at now? And do you feel like things are shifting or changing? Yeah. So um, first for folks to know, I did not decide to move to Orange County for no reason at all, but I actually grew up here. <laughs> and so like it, it is, it is considered home for me. Um, I don't know many people who do um, decide to come here regardless uh, beyond just like work or if you want to start a family and whatnot, but you know, you are absolutely right. It is more on the politically right of where we stand at least. Um, but I do see a huge shift between when I grew up here versus when I moved here. And then, I mean, it did the, the, the great blue wave that happened in the midterm elections definitely did have a huge impact here in Orange County. This is one of the first times that Orange County even voted in blue. Um, and then also, so that it actually shifted in terms of the presidential election, but then also it shifted in the midterm election. And we won a bunch of, like a lot of the seats that were held by very, very traditional conservative right wing um, Orange County folks, just they lost it. They lost their seats and it was a very, very empowering movement. <clears throat> I do think that the like Orange County is still Orange County. Like as much as like we say that it's it's getting there in terms of their consciousness around um, race and um, gender and even even a little bit around the LGBTQ um, QI community, but the plus community. But like it's not. It's but it's still not there um, and. But I like during the being here during all of the Black Lives Matter stuff, because essentially what we are is we are the suburban community that Trump is talking about in terms of um, in terms of like the, the end is near type of thing and it's the end of the world. Um, but it was really, really great to see all these local small or local youth organizations come out and organize protests in front of um, and um, marches in front of the Santa Ana like city council or city hall or and then also just in front of like county buildings, Orange County, like government buildings and even what was crazy for me and for folks who don't know the geography of Orange County, North Orange County has tended to become more of like the 
middle class, working class folks. And that includes like Santa Ana, Garden Grove, Westminster and whatnot. And then you go to South Orange County and that's where like the real House of OCs are from. That's where you have like all of the, the more, the more, um, I mean, it's the real House of, House of or Housewives um, live. So there was actually a, a march or it was a, protest type of march but it was a march for black uh, demonstration for black lives matters down there and it was led by like a, it was like a sea of like of like south oc folks who were there in support of black lives matters and just in support of everything and it was a very like eye-opening experience for me at least to be like oh shifts are happening and they're happening in orange county and it's it feels good it feels good to have that um but we are still far behind from the rest of the state and far behind from certain parts of of the country because we also have where like we still have the anti-maskers here we have the covid deniers we have the um those folks that are are definitely still trying to start things up. I mean, it it doesn't help that most of the TikToks that I see are like all of the Karens are all from the South OC right now. So like that it's that still exists. But um, but I think that also I mean one of the things that I think is is the reason is because you know LA LA County is getting very expensive for folks, and so if you're a young family or a young couple who wants to start a family um orange county still has some pockets where people can go and be around young people um young people meaning like my age and my mid 30s but like still like young but be around young people who like want to start young or young families who want to start something um so that is helping to shift kind of the demographic <clears throat> of Orange County, I feel. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still, it is still a little bit on the more conservative side. Yeah. So when, when you think about the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, um, the uprisings from the summer, um, what do you think the role is of folks who are Asian or Asian American in kind of, I think maybe both and maybe confronting or responding to kind of some of our, you know, conservative family members or community members. Yes. Um, yeah. But even overall, like in, in this arc towards justice and, and liberation, yeah. what role should and can Asian and Asian American folks play? I mean, we should, we should be looking like our, our priority. And, and I feel like this is constantly spoken about, but our, our main priority as Asians, who a lot of us are first generation, second generation Asians, um, where our, and we should be go, looking inward and actually challenging our family members around, around what it means to support Black lives. Um, and that, because there is a lot of, there is a lot of um, institutionalized racism that has kind of permeated into our families brains right through through everything that we've always tried to talk against in our circles in our communities we never brought it back to our family beyond thanksgiving dinner or or whatever we came back from college so like that is that was the pivotal this is the pivotal moment for that because it is so in everyone's face that they have to talk about it and they have to continue talking about it because I mean, I don't know about your family or other Asian folks' families, but like our family, families continue, they, families only just focus on the news and where the news shifts. So once, once Black Lives Matters doesn't get primetime air billing on CNN or Fox or whatever, whatever news thing that our parents are watching, they're going to forget about it too. So it's constantly bringing it back and reminding them that like Black Lives Matters is a very real thing that's happening and that's existing. Um, and that it is something that's not just a temporary thing or just a thing that's happening because of the pandemic. It's something that we need to constantly challenge. Um, but also there is a real thing about being 
the Asian about the Asian community in Orange County. And the other thing is is opening up your purse strings and really supporting the movement and supporting the folks that are doing the fight on the ground. <clears throat> because we are privileged in in many ways in Orange County and it's how to how to really challenge ourselves in order to do it. And so I think like there's so many levels of like both just education within our community and our family, but then also like really physically supporting the folks who are doing this stuff on the ground. Um, and I mean, I would even bring that beyond just BLM, but also like folks who are doing electoral work or folks who are, you know, like, especially now doing the advocacy work and the, the, um, the work at the, at the clinics that of like for, to help support these women who are making the hardest decisions of their lives. And like, those folks also need the support um, of folks who have the means to do it. Yeah, I no, I I, um, I appreciate that. I, I will say that you know, especially as someone who was an integral part to my own like development, I think you are one of um, the first folks. I mean, I think it was you as a say, but it specifically under your guidance, like helping me better clarify and understand like what role I should and could play as an Asian, as a Filipino, Filipinx American, but also Asian American in a world where like as much as we don't want to, um, it to be specifically black and white per se, that that's how the world sees us, right? And so yeah. there may be times we may be closer in proximity to, to blackness or to whiteness and that then as, as, um, gives us certain types of privileges or access and so what does it mean to be in certain spaces and so i help i hold that with me a lot where i'm like okay well like how am i creating space for others how am i making sure that those who are most vulnerable and most most directly and disproportionately impacted are centered or at the table um so i think that's an i i just appreciate kind of your role in kind of planting that seed or at least like helping that grow but also like what to like also then continue to find ways to to play that role even in your work now even if it's not necessarily in directly a nonprofit space because i think those i think it's it's more of of us and more of other people being like i can play this role no matter where i'm at no matter like what what what, what my work is that yeah. like i can and should um take action and so i think the more that we can encourage folks to, 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 to do that, the, the better. Um, um, so yeah, so I, I think that's something that I'm, I continue to figure out, like what are, what are ways that's not just necessarily being in the streets, right? But yeah. having that conversation with your family member is actually just as important. Like being able to like provide accessible and relatable like sources that you know include facts, right? Totally. Like that's super critical. Like I, yeah. I find that especially in kind of this social media dominant society we live in now, right? So yeah. all of that to say that like there are different kinds of roles and folks shouldn't feel restricted or that because maybe they're not seen on TV or they're not out in the streets. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not doing critical, necessary and impactful work. Totally, yeah. And you know, like I've always been and I think it was always very clear to you but I've always never I've never liked being in front of the world the world so <laughs> I'm always been very much like the support network and I actually think that that's a very critical role for anybody to take and um is that like it is all about one there it is the world isn't black and white and we we all are very clear with that but also too it's like you're we need to also provide those spaces for folks to be able to speak up about what they want to happen or what they need to happen. Um, and so like, I totally appreciate that, what you just said, because like, that was one of my key things too, even at USSA, which was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know shit. It's these students who are still students that will be able to the ones that will fight and advocate for what they need. Um, we just create that space and we create that space to make sure that everybody feels included. Um, and I think that that's the key thing that is always 
missing sometimes and that's that's even very clear in this world too in the the small business profit side of things which is like we're not creating space necessarily to include everyone and that's a huge disservice both to your own self but then also to to um the folks that that just feel sidelined all the time Mm -hmm. for sure um, I'm really appreciating this conversation. I am, I'm mindful that we have a little less than 10 minutes. So oh, I wanted to, I know that the time just kind of just zoomed on by, yeah. <laughs> but, a, but one thing that I always, I always um, op- uh, allow or at least open the opportunity is for you to ask any questions of me. Um, oh my God. So I don't know if there is a question or two that you would like to ask, but this is, um, and, and things, uh, this is your chance. I mean, are we are we about to get like super super deep and super super meta? It's up to you. I will, <laughs> anything's on the table. How about that? Anything's on the table, and um, you can ask me whatever you like. Yeah. So I guess I guess one thing um, that I mean, I would love to hear more about you. Your what is your fear around? Can't stop. Won't stop. Um, and, and embarking on this really, really exciting journey. Um, and, um, or if you've identified it already, like what is kind of your process of what you, you're going to do to get beyond it? Yeah. So I think, I think my initial, my initial fear was, um, it like, like it not landing or it not it not being something that people would um, would find helpful or useful. Mm-hmm. And I think there was, you know, because I think part of the origin story of Can't Stop, Won't Stop was that it was something that Carmen and I dreamt up of in 2009, so years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was something that existed in like, in a tax ID formal like setting, but like it wasn't until 2017 where I decided to kind of take it on full time. Mm-hmm. And I, people were going to saying like, what was, what made you feel like you actually could jump to do that um, full time um, or to like, you know, to, to give it, give it, give it all your energy. And I think, I, I think I jumped into it with my dream, but also with the fear in that like i was like i'll never know unless i actually give it the time because i was like like nothing just grows on its own you have to make sure it has the right amount of sunlight you're giving it water how are you nurturing for it and caring for it and so i i was like i had to internalize that and say look if i want this company to 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 grow or to do to be more than just a a, 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 a paper that mm-hmm. that's within the DC um, office <laughs> or in the a federal IRS, like yeah. I have to take, give it the time and energy to do that. And so um, I like was like I said, like if I can't believe in myself, then why would other people? Why would other people believe believe in me or in can't stop, won't stop? And so yeah. I think it was that fear and that willingness or that and that leaning into it, that saying like I actually have to give it give it my all or else I'm not giving the company or even this dream of mine a fair chance. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, it's, and that's, I think, I mean, we talked a little bit about this too in our, in our first initial call, which was like, that's the thing that's hardest about doing this work is that there's that fear of like, um, is this going to work? And that's, that comes, I feel like that comes from, I mean, for me, it came a lot from like the imposter syndrome concept, right? Like I was always completely like, does it make sense for us to be here? Um, And I also think that just happens when you are a Asian person and when, because it's very culturally ingrained in us (laughs) that we always are going to be fearful. Um, And then also, um, that we will never be a, a success of what we should be. And so that's great. I mean, I think that you you are heading in the right direction and you hit it head on, which is super, you should be proud. I'm proud, at least. I'm proud, I'm proud of where you are now versus that one trip when you came to DC. <laughs> 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 wow that was like more than 10 years ago scott i know look at how much you've grown 
<laughs> um, well, I I will say that I'm I, I'm very grateful because I feel like through my path, like through like my organizing path, my development and leadership pipeline and path, that there are many folks, including you, who are so pivotal to being to welcoming me, to making me feel like like the the sky was the limit, to like making me feel more comfortable in who I was. Like yeah. I and I feel like being able to bring nation of those experiences, the formation of my identity, the formation of my politic, and standing, standing, being able to stand tall and true to who I am, who I was, who I'm becoming, is, has made me feel a lot more aligned with, like, what I'm trying, like, my, my dreams and my vision. So yeah. I want to take this opportunity in the same way that I started to just say thank you because you even even years later when i was like hey could you be on the board of my business you were like yes and i don't i know we joke joke about it but every time i ask you anytime i've ever asked you for support or guidance or anything you have been so welcome and i think totally. i'm only, i'm able to only do what i do because so many people like you have been so gracious and um, of, of of your time and your energy. And so thank you, because oh. I, 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 I don't take it lightly. And I know that I wouldn't be here, um, literally wouldn't be here if it wasn't um, uh, for people like you. I appreciate that, but you did all the work. So like, you shouldn't give me all this credit. <laughs> it was, you were the one that like, took initiative and became a leader and have split been a trailblazer ever since so like i was only there to make sure you didn't get into trouble <laughs> well as as um the great late um john lewis said may he rest in peace mm -hmm. there's there's always some good trouble let's get in some good trouble <laughs> that's the truth um, with that being said, Scott, um, in this final minutes that we have here, um, if folks are interested in getting in touch or getting in contact with you, what is, what's the best way for folks to do that? I mean, I have random IGs, but you guys can contact me at the, you just can Instagram me at BRB eating and that's really a food blog, but that's just because I need an avenue to get away from everything. Or you guys can also get in touch with second space at, uh, at second space OC. Um, I check both those Instagrams and they're both mine. So um, if you just want to reach out and say, hi, I will say hi. Okay. Okay. And then I guess my last question to you is, um, for, for folks who are newer to organizing or maybe recently um, into kind of social justice work, what is your, what is your parting, your parting word, words of wisdom or parting advice for, for folks who are like digging in for the first time, maybe because of the pandemic or yeah. the uprisings from the summer? So one thing that I wish I was better at was, and we're, you're always going to constantly hear this is self-care and all that other stuff, but like burnout is super real. So I think one of the things that's key is to get a community and get folks who are also in it and um, who can help remind you to not get burned out because um, if because without it, I don't think I would have necessarily gotten out of nonprofit the way I got out of it. And then also, I don't think I would have continued to stay within politics if it weren't for, for my community mm -hmm. um, um, of folks to kind of, but like, that's the key thing. Find, find a community that supports beyond just your organization or just your coalition partners. And then also don't, and then also be very aware of burnout and what it does to you. Mm. Yeah. Whew. So yeah, that's that's when they say when can't when when you should stop and sometimes we'll stop. Yes, for <laughs> sure. Always, don't take can't stop, won't stop too, no. too, too much to heart. <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> but you know what I my reframe to that is has been well we can't stop, won't stop fighting for justice, can't stop, won't stop loving ourselves and our communities. And sometimes that means that we we rest and that we take breaks and that we we do fun things. So yes. there's there's a there's there's always a way that we we can still can't stop one stop, but just in a different kind of way. <laughs> Definitely, yes, that is the best way to put it.
<laughs> All right. Well, Scott, this has been super um, awesome. Thank you so yeah. much for taking time out of your um, your day. Of course. Um, Sending, all, sending love from DC to Orange, to OC, to Orange County, and we'll definitely be in touch. Yeah, definitely. I love you, and you're doing a kick-ass job. Uh, thank you, Scott. I love you, all too. Right. Have a good <laughs> rest of your day. All right, bye.